And that for me is like the most important thing to have my practice be sustainable because I feel like I'm in this for the long haul and I really like it. I mean, I, I just love my work. And, and so I feel like what's most important to me is not to like hurry up and make a bunch of money really quick, but to be like, I'm in this to be enjoying this for a really long time to come. This is Therapist Clubhouse, a podcast for private practice entrepreneurs. I'm Annie Schusler. This week, I'm talking to Chris Weipert, a private practice entrepreneur in San Francisco. Listen as she talks about finding her niche and balancing a thriving practice with life as a parent and musician. Welcome, Chris. Thanks for being here. Well, thanks for having me, Annie. So full disclosure, we are close friends and we've known each other for about 17 years. Whoa. <laughs> I know. Whoa. Yeah. Whoa. Long time. How is it that that much time has passed? <laughs> I want to talk about your entrepreneurial journey and your private practice. So how long have you been in private practice? And at this point, who are you seeing in your practice? Well... I think I've been in practice for about 17 years, I think, either 16 or 17. So right around, you know, because we met in grad school mm -hmm. and I was starting in a private practice internship right mm -hmm. during that time. So let's see, what was the other question? How long? And who do you see I've now? Oh, well, currently, I guess for the last... 10 years or so, I've had a specialty of working with fertility, pregnancy, and new parenthood issues. Mm -hmm. So kind of that, that range of transition time for individuals and for couples. Mm -hmm. And how did you figure out that that was who you wanted to be working with now? Well, you know, I was thinking, I feel like so many therapists end up being drawn to like experiences that they go through mm -hmm. and suddenly they're interested in it and they want to work with people with those issues. And um, so that's no different for me. I, I think it was, you know, my own kind of parenting, my, my fertility, pregnancy, parenting journey that really inspired me to get interested in it. You know, like just how, how challenging the experience was in a way that I hadn't anticipated, like mm -hmm. a lot of bumps along the way, you know, having like a miscarriage at one point, which was really painful and surprising that so many people go through it, but nobody talks mm -hmm. about it. Yeah. And, you know, challenging pregnancy and then just how mind blowing the whole thing was, <laughs> like mm -hmm. how life changing with a person's identity, like my identity was changing in every way. My relationships were changing, body changing. And it's like, it happens so often because everybody who's around was born. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but when you go through it yourself, you realize, whoa, this is really a mind blowing experience. So mm -hmm. I guess I just got interested in working with people around all the changes and transformations and challenges of that time period. Yeah, there's almost no there's almost no area of life that doesn't get touched by becoming a parent. Yeah. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Yeah, including, you know, being a therapist and I mm -hmm. thought that, that was fascinating too, you know, be being pregnant as a therapist and that whole journey. I wish more therapists would write about that too. Yeah, uh, and I, I went yeah. through that too and and it's very, you know, it definitely changes your clinical work and it's something in the room if you're pregnant, it's something in the room that becomes really obvious. <laughs> totally. Yes, this like very present part of you and your outside yeah. is in the room. And, and yeah, definitely an impact. Yes. On work and everything. And with the parents who you've been working with, have you found that they are coming in talking about some of the stuff that you just mentioned? Yes. I mean, mm -hmm. for sure. I feel like I, I see people in a lot of different parts of that mm -hmm. journey, I guess. You know, I've see, I see people around some of the fertility time. I mean, some people I've worked with that are trying to get pregnant and maybe they don't even end up being able to get pregnant mm -hmm. and yet I'm still working with them, you know, so there's kind of that whole time or there's 
during pregnancy and maybe anxiety coming up, fears of becoming a parent, or, you know, there's just so many types of issues that would come up, or couples that are trying to deal with some longstanding issues or to prepare for, you know, for a family. Mm -hmm. And then a lot, I feel like probably the most, I end up seeing the most new moms, like Mm -hmm. moms that are overwhelmed, that are really struggling with like the feeling of having such high expectations of themselves Mm -hmm. and feeling very disappointed with themselves and critical and hard on themselves and feeling isolated. And, you know, it's just, it's a really challenging time. I feel like in our society, the way we set up new moms to feel like they're not perfect, which none of us are. And the partner relationship changes so much that it's really challenging to feel like for for them to try to figure out how to feel supported by each other. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So all that stuff. And so you're saying once, once people are new moms, that's probably the area, the time when they come to see you, they start seeing you the most often. That makes sense. And are a lot of people coming in with either a postpartum depression or anxiety that they're identifying that way? Yeah. I mean, there's a, there's definitely several people that come in Mm -hmm. um, like knowing that or Mm -hmm. maybe having a, you know, midwife or healthcare provider sort of identify it and encourage them to get more support or them just wondering if, if they're experiencing that or not. And they are experiencing it, but they, you know, have no idea that that's what's going on. So, Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm thinking too. So you've been a parent for a lot longer than a lot of these folks who are coming Mm -hmm. in and you started seeing parents when it was a lot more recent for you. What's it like as you get more and more years away from that immediate transition? Mm. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I mean, it feels like a couple of things. Like on the one hand, it feels like having more perspective is helpful, like being further away from it and kind of knowing like it just keeps going. (laughs) (laughs) This is not the last challenge you will face as a parent, (laughs) but, but, you know, kind of getting a bigger picture of like, this feels like it's going to last forever, but it's temporary. And Mm -hmm. there's a bigger, you know, bigger life out there and in a future. Mm -hmm. But the other piece is interesting because I think, you know, I, I continue to wonder in my own practice, like, is this what I want to keep specializing in? You know, like I, because I have for a long time. And so now I've really built up momentum where I can get like steady stream of referrals coming in. So I don't want to change that because that's a good thing. But then as I'm going through different things in my life, I start getting interested in other things. And it's always interesting to wonder, like, when do you branch off and start to focus on something else if that's more interesting? Right. Because if you have a niche and, you know, I'm always talking about this and guests are always talking about this. If you have a niche, it is a really... It it makes it easier to grow your practice. It makes it easier to keep it full, to be known, to come to mind when people are making a referral. So it's really effective. Mm -hmm. And for a lot of people, it doesn't tend to be one and done. Like it doesn't tend to be that we we have one niche and then we stick with it forever. So that that absolutely makes sense to me, Chris. Yeah. You know, you still love it, but who knows? Right. I had much more clarity after having a child that I was one and done. <laughs> <laughs> that part felt good. <laughs> that was clear. <laughs> but you're right. You know, now there's other things like, I mean, just getting older and having parents getting older than, you know, kind of grief and loss issues or aging issues become more interesting. You know, there's just, that's the thing that's so great, though, I feel like about being a therapist is that life is so interesting and there's just an endless number of experiences and things that we'll go through and that, you know, that we could decide to focus on if we want to kind of, if we we want to do a little more of a deep dive in Mm -hmm. some area. So I think that's cool. It's very unlimited. Yeah. Yeah. So you don't have to get bored, you know? 
you know, speaking of your niche, you and and how you're able to keep your practice full within that mm-hmm. niche, you have a really steady flow of referrals and it's been that way for a long time. What do you think outside of having your niche, what do you think is contributing to that? Well, I mean, it feels like there are these different areas that I've tried to build up so that that steady stream is coming through. And and I do have to say, I don't know actually if it if it always feels steady in the okay. moment. Like it yeah. feels like there are waves. Yes. That's what I would describe. I, I always feel like, why is it that I get several calls in one day? Like that's so weird to me. And then none for a long stretch, you know, like, I don't know, or like in a week time that there's just sort of like, Boom, everyone decides <laughs> to call me that Time week. Time to call Chris. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But then another, you know, then there'll be weeks that go by. I'm like, oh my God, what happened? Like, yeah. no one's calling. What's going on? So I, I no, that's like such a good point. That. Yeah. And, and I think for people who haven't been in it for as long, it's so good to know that, that it, it happens in these really random waves and that you'd have to step way back to look at it and see it as steady that like day to day. To see the pattern, right? Yeah. Like you, mm-hmm. you're good at that, Annie, you and your spreadsheets. I love you. Some spreadsheets. <laughs> you, you probably see the pattern, but I just right. feel like you're random waves. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, but yeah, so let's see. I feel like, I mean, I feel like the, the most, um, let's see, the most fun part of the way that I maintain like referrals coming in is just staying connected to colleagues that I like, like mm-hmm. people that are, you know, kind of colleagues slash friends. And, you know, maybe people that are more colleagues than friends, but that I like them. And so I like to go out to lunch and connect. And then I just feel like we're both top of mind for each other. Yeah. So that feels, that's my favorite. Yeah. But and then, how often are you doing that, Chris? I mean, I would say I, I also go in waves with that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I kind of will be like, oh, I haven't done it for a while. And I send out a bunch of emails. And so then I end up with a bunch of like lunch dates in a row and then say, oh my God, that's enough and take a break. So, but probably it's like one a week, maybe, mm-hmm. um, you know, if I spread it out or every other, something like that. Very yeah. impressive such a great way that you keep it full. Yeah. What else? You're in a, you're in a networking group. Right. Yeah. So I am in a a networking group that is specifically with the focus of, of pregnancy and parenthood. Like these are a group of women that are professionals in all different areas. So everything from, you know, acupuncturists or pediatricians or yoga instructor or chiropractor, you know, so, and there's just a couple of people in each profession and we get together once a month, connect, like kind of do presentations for each other and organize events and stuff like that. So that's been sometimes great and sometimes not as fun for me, but, but I do feel like I love knowing who's out there so that I feel like I'm a good Mm -hmm. referral giver, you know, that I, that I can really solidly give some good referrals to my clients. And then I also feel like, cause we have a website for that group. And so people will end up finding me there and that's great. Mm-hmm. And then there's a natural um, parenting resource center that I'm a professional member of. So people will find me there too. And then there's like psychology today, which I feel like I get almost no clients from, but I feel like it's it's just like one more place that people see that I'm a real therapist, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Like, I feel like these several points of like that, that if they Google me or something and they're like, oh, she's in a few places that then they're like, okay, she must know what she's doing. <laughs> and yeah, like with psychology today or whatever directory tends to come up really high for the people who you want to work with. It's like, if you get one really good referral that sticks with you for a while, that's going to pay for years of that directory. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Totally true. And it's always hard to know exactly like, Mm -hmm. like maybe they saw me in a couple of places and psychology today was one of them. So I just kind of have to trust that 
it's helping enough, you know? Yeah. 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 Yeah, And the research is telling us that a lot of times people will, will need to see us eight times before Mm. they reach out. Wow. And that would be an average. So some people, you know, just are ready right away, but then think about how many times some other people must be needing to check us out. Oh man. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> That's a lot. <laughs> we need to put our face on billboards everywhere. <laughs> so you have another another part of your life that is really interesting is you're a singer songwriter and yeah. you perform. I mean, not all the time, but you you perform and you're fantastic. Aw. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The the thing that I always have to be ready for if I'm going to hear you sing is that it's always going to make me cry. So I have to be like, all right, buckle up. (laughs) I'm ready to cry. (laughs) That's good. Then I've succeeded. (laughs) Yeah. In both of your roles, you're probably always making people cry. Yeah. That's the goal, right? (laughs) But what's true, that is funny. It is. It's about emotion. What's it like for you to be in both of those roles? What's it like to be a performer being on stage Uh, knowing that you're a therapist? Yeah. I mean, I guess it's funny because they feel so separate, actually. Mm -hmm. I like when I'm on stage, I'm not thinking that much about being a therapist. I mean, it comes up just because it's a big part of my identity, but, and I'm definitely not thinking about it when I'm a therapist, although sometimes a client will have an issue and I'll, a, a song that I wrote will come to mind and I just feel like <laughs> bur- bursting out in song, being like, it reminds me of this song, but I never do that. <laughs> I've never done it yet. So, but, but I do think that it's interesting just in the way that like, that, that I feel like there are some real similarities in the ways that, that I enjoy things about each that are connected and yet they're so different. Mm -hmm. Like I do feel like what I have always loved about being a singer songwriter and, you know, when I was doing that more full time before becoming a therapist was just this feeling that, that people would connect with the music in this setting where they're, they're out with other people and they're connecting to this music and it's, so personal to them, but it also feels like it makes them feel not alone. Mm -hmm. You know, that it's a shared experience. Like I'm naming something that's very personal to me in a song and they're connecting with it and feeling like it helps them access some emotion or, or deeper layers of experience and, and that they feel less alone. And, you know, and, and in the room with other people having that same experience. So, And I was thinking about that, that I guess that's really similar to being a therapist too, that even though I'm not sharing my experience as a therapist, like I am when I'm up on stage, that, that they are feeling less alone Mm -hmm. because they're like sharing this, this experience and I'm right there with them, right? In this way that, that we are sharing it and they're feeling kind of less isolated. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that totally makes sense. It also makes me think the way that you're talking about this makes me think that you having been a therapist for 18 years or however many really helps with this piece of feeling like you're integrated as a human. You know, you, all of the parts of you, even if they're separate, you're integrated. You're not, you're not caught up in feeling like, oh my gosh, I'm a therapist. How can I get on stage? The way that maybe it would feel in the very beginning. Um, mm, yeah, you're really comfortable in all of these roles as a mom, as a singer songwriter, as a therapist. Not that there aren't still ups and downs, but that um, I think that yeah. really being kind of seasoned helps with that. That's true for sure. I mean, I've never though like had a client show up at a performance or something like that. That would mm, that hard. would challenge me in a whole different way. So. <laughs> You know, I've had maybe a couple people see something online where they're like, wait, are you also a singer? And, you know, that's uncomfortable too. It's just like, they're such different identities, but I think you're right. It throws me off a lot less now than it Mm -hmm. would have early on. And so speaking of different roles, how do you like to set up your time? And so I'm thinking in particular, you know, knowing that you're a parent 
how many sessions do you like to have a week and what do you like your schedule to look like? Hmm. I, I think it's evolved over time for sure. It was very different when I had, you know, when my daughter was a baby and when I was before she was in school, like mm-hmm. when I was home with her a lot. Um, at that time, I really liked having, I didn't exactly alternate days, but, but almost like that. I, I loved being able to be excited to go to work, <laughs> to get away because it's mm-hmm. so tiring to be a parent. I'd be like, yes, I'd walk into my office and it would be clean yeah. and peaceful. <laughs> Nobody was like, hanging on me, you know, at least yep. not physically. Um, <laughs> so it just felt like such a, a relief, like a break, actually. Mm. But then I would start missing her during the day and I would be so glad that I would get to have maybe the next day off, you know, mm. and get to to see her and be at home. And, you know, and then it would go back and forth that way. It was always nice to have something to look forward to. So I wasn't just stay at home or just working like full time. Mm-hmm. And I still don't work. I mean, it, it's so hard to know what full time is as a therapist. I mean, yeah. I guess people have really different experiences of that or, you yeah. know, but I feel like, so I work four days a week, like Monday through Thursday. And I see around 15 clients a week. Mm-hmm. Um, like sometimes more and I'm sort of experimenting with that, like what it would be like to grow it closer to 20. But but I I tend to feel pretty exhausted, I noticed, if it gets closer to 20. And that for me is like the most important thing to have my practice be sustainable because I feel like I'm in this for the long haul and I really like it. I mean I, mm-hmm. I just love my work. And and so I feel like what's most important to me is not to like hurry up and make a bunch of money really quick, but to be like, I'm in this to be enjoying this for a really long time to come, you know? Mm -hmm. So I don't want to burn out. I don't want to see too many clients, too many in a day, you know, like, like seven sometimes I'll see, but it definitely is like pushing it. Like Mm -hmm. I, I prefer to see about five in a day. Or, you know, or less, but five is okay. And, you know, and I, I just feel like I also want to make sure I don't have too many clients that, that are exhausting for me. Like, I really, yeah. I really love liking my clients. I noticed that recently because I had a couple of people that I was like, gosh, they were new. And I'm like, I don't really like them. And it bummed mm-hmm. me out. I mean, it was fine. It was, there was nothing bad about it. Mm-hmm but I didn't look forward to seeing them. And not that you can always feel that way, but I do feel like that's a little bit of a luxury the longer I'm in practice, that I'm focusing in on, okay, that's important to me. There are a lot of people I like. I mean, I can like a wide range of people. Yeah. I don't need to hang out with them as a friend, but I can like them. And it's funny because this, this client who I was feeling that way about ended up being like, you know, I think I'm kind of done. I'm not sure if if what it was, if it's not the right connection or I'm not ready to go deep. And, and I was like, okay, that's good. I mean, you know, it's just an interesting thing that, yeah. It's not, I was like, okay, now I'm back to, (laughs) I like everybody. Looking forward to everybody. Yeah. Yeah. That feels so good. Yeah. And what's your fee, Chris? My fee is 180 for individuals and 190 for couples. And how do you feel about your fee? I feel I feel really good about my fee right now. It's been I've had this fee for I think at least a couple of years now. So so now I'm feeling really solid about it. I always um struggle to push ahead to raise the fee and then feel comfortable with it. That that I feel like is always hard until I get someone paying that new fee without hesitating and then I can go, "Okay, all right." This is good. This is the right fee. But but yeah, it's it's good for now. I feel like I know other people are now raising higher. I remember when I got to 180 because I did a jump up from 160 and I was like, good, I'm set. I'm here. Now I'm done. <laughs> I don't need to worry about raising my fee again. But of course, time <laughs> goes on. And I'm like, oh, 
why I'm but you know that it. that's really interesting, Chris. I mean, I know then it changes, then you got to raise it again. But feeling that way about your new fee probably means it's the right new fee that you're feeling yeah. like, yes, this I'll feel good with this fee for a while. That's yeah. how we should feel, not like what's the smallest amount I could raise it. But really, right. How, what yes. would be that feeling? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think that's really true. And I know, you know, I've told you this before that like starting early on in my, in my practice, I had a, like a business group that was a, just a few peers, just a few colleagues that we got together and just supported each other in our businesses, like Mm -hmm. in our business goals. And that was so incredibly helpful. And I, I, I feel like to me that I just encourage anybody in their own business, any kind of business to have something like that where you can, so you don't feel alone and you can connect with other people that are in your similar situation and, and, and talk about all those things like fees and stuff. And that, for me, that really pushed me to raise my fees. There were like a couple of men in this group that I just loved, but they were, they had such an easier time raising their fees and it pissed me off. I was like so annoyed and had my, you know, feminist like rage (laughs) going Mm -hmm. like, this isn't fair. Men are so comfortable doing this. And what about, you know, I mean, I just had, had this real resistance to letting myself step into something like that Mm -hmm. coming from like, you know, mental health agency where social justice is so important and stuff and, and feeling almost like those two don't go hand in hand. And, but I finally was just like, I got so annoyed that I was like, you know what? I'm just going to raise my fee. Yeah. And when I did, it was such a relief because then I didn't have to be pissed off. I was just like, Oh, now I'm happy. (laughs) I'm getting yeah. more money. Yeah, because yeah. in this case, you're giving your and and I've been there too, like giving yourself the short end of the stick. Yeah, 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 totally. So so that felt good, and I hope to keep pushing myself along in that way because I I do feel like I don't know I feel like it's good for us as therapists and as women, you know, Mm -hmm. to kind of push ourselves in that area. And it's good for us as women seeing women clients to kind of be holding that, you know, that sense of value and like modeling that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And getting really comfortable with that, with saying the fee and saying it with a smile. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Chris, if you could time travel, to the very beginning of your private practice. Yeah. What would you tell the Chris of that time? Hmm. I mean, I would say, I mean, first I would say to hang in there. Mm -hmm. Um, And I would say, I mean, so one of the challenges for me is I feel like I started my private practice as an intern. So Mm -hmm. it was an internship. And one of the things about that was like I had very low fees because I was an intern and people started to know me as, oh, she's that, that really good intern with low fees, Mm -hmm. refer to her. I don't know, you know, so I almost, sometimes I, I wish I could go back and kind of say, I mean, except I'm not sure I'm ambivalent about this, but like to hold off and I wonder what it would have been like to have started private practice after I got licensed Mm -hmm. because making that transition was so hard to start changing the way people thought about me from the good therapist with the low fee to just a good therapist with a regular fee, you know, like Mm -hmm. to refer people to me for that reason. And yeah, like that really kind of sucked, that transition time. And now, you know, it feels so much easier. So I think I would say, you know, whatever, if, if I was me and I just made the choices I made to hang in there, to like be patient, that it really does keep getting easier, that feels impossible, but it does keep getting easier if you, if you hang in there and to just keep those connections going with 
other colleagues. I feel like that was one of the best things I did. And I would, I, you know, would always enforce that to my younger self, like, just don't let yourself feel isolated and alone, like go to clinical consultation group, have your business colleagues, like have support and like these pillars of support so that you're not feeling all alone in your practice. Excellent. Yeah. And will you help me answer a question that came in from a listener? Of course. Listener question. So this person said, I'm planning to have a child in the next couple of years if all goes well. How do you handle maternity leave in private practice? I'm terrified of losing all of my clients. Yeah. I mean, it feels like, of course, everyone's situation is so different. I guess it really depends too on the support they have from their partner or like money that they have saved up in terms of how much anxiety there is about the time off, Mm -hmm. you know, because it's true. Like when you're taking off in private practice, you're taking off. (laughs) There's, uh, Mm -hmm. you know, nobody paying you like half your fee while you're away. You're just, you're gone. But I feel like if you can set it, if you can feel prepared and really accept that and accept that, that you need to kind of like re-enter gradually and to trust that. I mean, I, I had some people that couldn't hang in there for it. I remember that either had stuff come up while I was pregnant, that it was just too hard to kind of um, handle that intrusion into the room as we were talking about earlier. But I had most of my clients hang in there and they saw other therapists while I was on maternity leave. And um, I'm still seeing, you know, like still seeing some of those people. They, I don't feel like your your practice has to fall apart by any means, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. I don't yeah. think you'll lose all your clients either. I'm working with someone right now who's anticipating a parental leave. And one thing they're doing is they're not taking any new clients mm-hmm. as it gets closer. And then they're planning on using all of these opportunities to refer out to build relationships so that when they come back, they kind of have that goodwill stepping back in. So yeah. that's, you know, that's a way to think about it. And Chris, I think you kind of just do that naturally. You probably did that naturally, but, but really think about how, how to strengthen the relationships. And then when you come back, I would encourage you also to do some networking with the people who it feels like this will be a good fit for. Do some networking where you can bring your baby. Like that's one thing. Mm. There'll be some of your colleagues who will want to meet your baby. And that way you can, obviously you're not going to bring your (laughs) baby to session with you, right? (laughs) but you can sometimes bring your baby to networking with certain colleagues. Yeah, that's a good idea. I mean, and and I also feel like it's important to, to just give yourself the time that you need to really get back up to speed. Cause you know, you can't anticipate how you're going to feel. And I feel like in a way, just if there are certain clients who decide that they don't want to continue, it helped me to just see that as like, okay, good. I get an extra hour, you know, like, (laughs) like at that moment, it was kind of a relief. Mm -hmm. You don't want to come back to a really intense full practice. It's the attrition helps you ease back in and it'll grow again. But gosh, I just feel like it's really hard to have the bandwidth to want it to grow fast right when you're coming back from maternity leave. Like, you know, you're kind of a little depleted at that point, kind of focused elsewhere. Yeah. Like give yourself as much time as you need and if you possibly can. Yeah. Yeah, totally. So mm. Chris, what is the best place for therapists to find you and throw compliments at you? That's so sweet. Let's see. I have a website that is chriswipert.com and that's Chris C H R I S. Wipert is W E I P as in purple, E R T. And yeah, my email is connected to that and stuff. So I guess that's the best way. Okay, fantastic. Thank you so much, Chris. Thanks for being willing to share your story. Oh, yeah. And thank you, Annie. I mean, and I just wanted to give a shout out to you and how awesome I feel like this 
podcast is that you're doing. I, I, oh, I'm going to get choked up. You believe it? I've known you for so long and I just feel really, I feel really proud of you. And I also feel so, I feel so excited for all the therapists out there who get to have this, this Mm -hmm. awesome gift that you give them. Because I listened to some of these podcasts and I was just really inspired and moved and that feeling of, of not being so alone in your practice really comes from stuff like this, listening to this podcast. So yay, Annie, thank you. <laughs> oh, thank you, sweetie. <laughs> yeah. Registration for the Superpower Method for Therapists group program is open until February 8th. We go through a 14-week process together. You'll get clear on your right fit clients and your niche. You'll identify your superpowers and how to use them in your business. You'll create a marketing plan based on those superpowers and your right fit clients, and you'll figure out where your practice is going next. Lots of therapists who go through the program decide to add services beyond in-office, individual, or couples therapy sessions. To learn more about the program, go to coachingwithannie.com and click on the superpower method. This program is designed to help you create a unique and profitable business. I'll be honest, it will take work. You'll have homework assignments throughout the program and group calls each week to support you through it. Each of those assignments will bring you closer to the private practice only you can create. Then after the 14 weeks are over, you'll get free ongoing support in our exclusive alumni program. Head over to coachingwithannie.com now to register or learn more. I'll see you next week. Oh my gosh, that was so sweet, Chris. <laughs> I didn't mean to. I know, so genuine. <laughs> oh. Aww.